So I'd like to um, call this meeting to order at 6-18-18-18. Um, and we've done a little bit of a check-in to make sure everything's okay. Um, the first thing we need to do is um, approve the minutes from the last meeting. Does anyone have any? Um, well, first of all, yeah. Let's approve minutes and then after any agenda amendments, but any changes to the March 16th minutes? Yes, no? No. For me. No. So this is Gordon. I'll make the motion to approve the minutes. OK, how do we do a vote? Um, we just a voice vote? Yeah. All right, all those in favor, unmute yourselves and say aye. 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 All those opposed, mute yourself and say no. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Stay <laughs> unmuted and say no. All abstained? All right. We like, so we probably have to to note Catherine is abstaining since she's not there. Since she's not here. Oh, where is she? She's not back yet. I don't yeah, see. Yeah, she be back. But okay. Um, any amendments to the agenda? Oh, let's see. I better call it up. Um, we've got a very packed one. Um, um. You know, I had everything open on my draft on my computer before, but I went and closed it all. Same here. To be uh, honest, though, I think there's, uh, from my perspective, there's plenty on the agenda, and I don't have anything else to add. We may want to do a small little sort of update on negotiations at the very end, um, and we can go into executive session to do that. All right. All right. Um, any public comment? I don't see any public on, but I'm seeing none. I'm going to move on. Um, Adam, do you want to give the State of the Union? Sure. So um, we're transitioning from uh, moving from what's considered um, by the state as a maintenance of education to a continuation of learning. and. Um, this is sort of the transition. Um, April breaks fall at different times in Vermont, a couple of different times. So for us, it's next week. And for others, it's the week after. Um, and the point where th there's kind of been two messages. Um, originally, con continuity of education was supposed to start the 6th um, so this week. But then we were told, well, you need to submit your continuity of learning plan by the 8th. Um, <clears throat> it's got to be in for the 13th when the process begins. So that's why I call this kind of a transition. For OSSU schools, our teachers were kind of, they came out of the gate, you know, pushing learning forward. And we've had to, I've talked a lot in my messaging about um, scaling back and taking care of yourself and not burning out because obviously this has to go to the end of the year. Our continuity of learning plan focuses a lot on the things that I've been talking about this year. So um, cultivating learner agency through reflective practice. Um, and also has those pieces uh, of Act 77 embedded in it. So flexible pathways, proficiency-based learning, and, and PLPs, or personalized learning plans, which I've referred to in the, in the plan as personalized learning processes, because we're looking at it more of a goal setting and reflection process. Um, <clears throat> we've been delivering meals on a weekly basis, originally every day, and now we've scaled back to every other day. So Monday, Wednesday, Friday, two meals on Monday, Wednesday, and, and one on um, Friday, uh, lunches and breakfasts. We're still running, uh, Kaylee is running our, um, our child care program for children of essential personnel, and we've kind of peaked at six or seven kids, I think. And um, she and I agreed that once it drops below four, four we'll kind of pull the plug. Or if we we lose uh, personnel due to, um, you know, illness or, or someone having to take, to take care of someone else with, with the illness. Um, what else? So, you know, given what I've heard and Heather and Amy and Dave and I have talked about this, you know, we hear things from other SUs and other states 
And there are some instances where schools really haven't done anything. It's just been touching base with kids on a daily basis and leaving it at that, kind of waiting for the state to catch up. Um, but you've got some really progressive folks in Vermont. And um, uh, I think the, the agency has been releasing a lot of uh, guidance. So we definitely have direction. A lot of that guidance contradicts the guidance from the prior day, but we're sort of muddling through it and finding our way. So the first two weeks, it was like a fire hose, constant. It's still coming out. So the update today, you know, had four new pieces of guidance in it around our federal funding, around special ed, um, homelessness. So it, the whole model has shifted. And, and often, you know, a decision by the governor or by the um, the commissioner will have a huge impact just based on the, what we're dealing with. So they'll hear it back from us in the field and they'll have to modify something for the next day. So we're still in that transition phase. Can I ask how the meal, the meals are going in terms of, oh wait, sorry, I'm just seeing this. You actually have it all planned out. I won't ask my question. That's okay. Yeah, we're up to about 400, I think, at this point, or last I checked, which was end of last week. Has there been any, um, like, is there any concern about, like, have you heard anything, I guess, or has anybody heard anything from families who are either not able to access this or are having trouble? I don't know if you guys are working in, in, um, in concert with the pantry at all or like how I'm I'm wondering as a whole in a com community wide how we're doing in terms of like food security and things like that yeah so um we uh, the uh OSSU uh the uh, coalition of partners met and that's been the prime objective or concern uh, since this all began uh, what can partners do to to um, help support families. So we're brainstorming around that. Um, food pantry and other, some other places have offered to help. Jasper Hill Farm, I think one day we delivered some of their goat milk, maybe some cheese. Um, but uh, we we're able to access some um, federal funds for um, summer meals. So at this point we can feed anyone 18 or, or younger, um, both, both meals. So. Uh, there's a lot of guidance coming out too around um, using funds for uh, flexible, more flexibly than we have been able to in the past, um, mostly federal dollars. But uh, it sounds like uh, people are doing okay. We've been working on internet connectivity. That's become a statewide issue. I'm seeing a lot of a lot of uh, buzz about that on the internet. Um, Early on, Dave sent out a, uh, a survey and it ended up, you know, revealing that most people had connectivity, but the range of that is pretty wide. So, you know, um, some people might be in a house with four people and it's the two adults, the parents are working and the two kids are, are learning and everyone's online and the bandwidth isn't uh, great enough. I think the biggest problem is uh, that what Dave's been referring to as the last mile. So those people where internet, they don't even have the option of purchasing. Um, so I've been in touch with the director of the Vermont Superintendents Association about that. And like I said, there's a lot of movement. I, actually, there's a story on VPR tonight and we were cited on that. Um, but I think this is kind of an impetus for getting connectivity to that last mile. I, I'm surveying the principals this week and uh, I spoke to um, Craig Wilson and Justine Guthrie this morning and they, it sounds like most principals were out of the gate with two weeks worth of packets. And now we're transitioning from those packets into more of this online learning. And each of them really only identified one family each that didn't have connectivity, maybe another who has spotty connectivity, but um, it's looking pretty good so far. Um, I did get a few comments back after I sent out the message about attendance. I think parents were concerned that they would have to be checking in, but you know they're working. And I assured them, no, it's the teacher and the student 
connecting via phone if you don't have internet or email. Um, so. So kids do have the option to call instead of having a, a, a video chat with their teacher? Yeah, so this is for, uh, so there, there are two things we're concerned with. One is attendance, and that's it, it's a pretty low bar for that. The state said, you know, you, you need to take attendance because we have to have 50% of our students showing up. Um, if we don't, that means we can't count it as a school day. So <clears throat> attendance means make some kind of connection with a student on a daily basis. That could be an email. It could be the student. You can see the student's been active in Google Classroom or Schoology, um, some kind of connection. But then the other thing we're concerned about is engagement. It's one thing to say, yeah, I'm here, and then see you later. But are, are kids um, you know, involved in learning? And, and schools are finding their way, ways to collect that data as well. Uh, and each school is doing it in a slightly different fashion. But that's something we're very concerned about. Is there going to be any required formal assessment process done at the end of the school year? I was just talking with, oh, what kind of, uh, like, like final exams for a high schooler, you mean? Or, yeah, or any way of sort of indicating what this period, what their yeah. proficiencies are. And Yep, so that's the next piece, and that's part of our continuity of learning plan. Um, Justine and, and Craig and I were talking about that this morning, too, assessment being sort of that next piece. Uh, we want to move kids toward a project-based, personalized model like we were doing at, you know, before this all started. Uh, but even in that model, in, the, in a conventional sense, you know, what does assessment look like? It's one thing to say, sure, you can target your math proficiency by measuring out uh, your backyard for a garden or whatever. But, but when do we assess what the students learned and what does that assessment look like? So these are, are questions I think that we're gonna be getting into. And, and what I'm telling teachers is, you know, we have this plan, but you're not expected to suddenly um, give up all you've been doing and adopt everything in the plan. That, that would be impossible. This is sort of a vision of where we're going and you need to find your own entry point into that. Or maybe the school decides as a collective, well, we're gonna start doing this piece. Um, so I want, you know, I think that's very important. Um, yeah. Has there been any, I, I realize it's early April, so I know this is an early time to ask it, but has there been any conversation about, um, cause I know that there's been rumblings or rumors or whatever about if this is a seasonal thing and we don't have a vaccination and we have to go sort of back into quarantine at some point next year, has there been any like sort of long-term talk yet? Or is that, it's totally fine if that's not quite where people are yet, but I'm just curious. Yeah, sure. So we've been told that we'd be getting information and guidance about the end of the year by May 8th. So by May 8th, we should have some direction from the state, uh, and they're anticipating the peak of this, you know, the surge being late April, early May, maybe. So there really hasn't been any talk about that. Um, but my sense is we'll get further guidance uh, sometime around the beginning of May when they can sort of get a better sense of where we are. Um, I think uh, if you listen to the, uh, was the governor on today or was it yesterday? All the days are blending. Yeah, today's Monday. It was today. So he was talking about, um, how they're anticipating the surge, although the social distancing is really working. Um, and, and, and you'll hear that even on um, NPR, you know, across the country, I think they're, and they're looking at the data from China, you know, and um, I think the mistake some of these other countries made, according to what they were saying, is that they came out of the social distancing too early once that peak had passed and they hit another bump uh, where the cases started rising again. So that's a great question. And I think if anything, they're going to err on the side of caution. So I think it's totally possible that um, we could we could see more of this either at the beginning of the fall or if, or if things start climbing after school begins, we could be told, well, we're going to go home for a couple of weeks. But at least we will have done it. And we will have had two and a half, three months of practice. Thank you. Yep. Anything else, Adam? 
I just want to, you know, really give kudos to teachers. Um, like I said, just, uh, you know, we hear stuff and, and I think, um, and, and, you know, the, I see the emails go back and forth. I'm on the, the, um, email lists and just a lot of support for, uh, sharing of strategies, um, sharing of videos for kids to say, we miss you. And, um, uh, it's really amazing. And same with the principals and the central office directors, just, you know, I've never, they, they never skipped a beat. There's, there's never a point where they're throwing up their arms and saying, well, how do we do this? Uh, each one has attacked it in their own way, uh, at their own school. And really, um, I don't think that would have been possible unless you hadn't had these relationships, these these strong school cultures already built and and we're sort of cashing in on that now you know um and each school is moving forward and the directors have been amazing you know dave was talking about the number of tickets the percentage has just increased um astronomically so we're talking about how he and his team are managing that heather is dealing with um you know guidance after guidance each day on on sped and that's really what are the big question marks still hanging out there? Um, Amy's dealing with, you know, trying to set people up so that they can learn from each other. Um, how do we take care of that pre-K two element that I talked about earlier? Um, you know, just a, a, a real, real co cohesive collective attacking the problem head on. So, Adam, would it help if we, the OSSU board, sent um, a letter of gratitude out to the faculty and the administrators and staff? That'd be great. It just, um, yeah, it's, you're there, suddenly everyone's job description has changed. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, um, it's a lot to deal with and it uh, could, I mean, it, it is anxiety provoking and people are stressed, but, but they're dealing. But I think that'd be a great gesture and people would appreciate it. Yeah. So would other people weigh in? Do you think that we should do that? Sure. I think that sounds really positive. I think um, just from here, it, it sounds, um, I'm hearing a lot of what Adam is saying and just the um, incredible work that other, that teachers are putting in and the new and interesting and dynamic ways that teachers are connecting with their, their kids and the level of collaboration among teachers is, is, has risen and just a lot of really positive things. So I, I, I would be on board with that. I think that recognition goes a long way because sometimes I think it can feel even with all the meetings and zoom and whatnot, that you're still in this funny bubble in your house. Right. So um, can other way in, because I was, my proposal was going to be that let me craft something, let me send it to Rose to kind of look at or send it around to folks to look Absolutely. at and then yeah. give a thumbs up or thumbs down. Yes, no. <clears throat> yeah, Amy, I think that's right. Um, post it on Google Docs and we can all make suggested okay. edits. Okay. That and sounds good to me. Is it something you would send to the newspaper or something that um, you'd send individually? How are you planning to um, do this appreciation? Um, I would send it out to the teachers through, I mean, we, I would send it from the OSSU board to all of the teachers and staff, to all staff, I guess. I mean, not just teachers, but administrators and you folks that are on this call and everybody else, just to let everyone know we really, we're paying attention and we know that this is really above and beyond and we appreciate it. And what if someone leaked it to the newspaper? What if someone did? I can send it to the newspaper as well. But let's I mean, get it written and get some feedback. Yeah. And, yeah. <laughs> I think it would be, I think that in some ways it would be really good to have a public recognition mm -hmm. so that, I mean, I think that, you know, the OSUED was trying to, we were supposed to be doing this big like teacher thing at all the three different schools. And I'm sort of struggling as to how to uh, still show our appreciation for what mm -hmm. they're doing, especially in this like, really big time where we can't go and like give them pastries so it i think that it would be great if uh something large came 
So here's the thing, because not all of our teachers would get the hard gazette. I would think we should send it to them from us as an individual right. email, and then we can sort of put something in the paper as well um, to say we have, this has been gone out to all teachers, but we want the community to know how much we appreciate what they're doing and how grateful we are. Cause you know, our teachers are also parents, by the way, Rose yeah. sitting there and that they've got other responsibilities and we want to acknowledge that and, and share. Well, and the Hardwick Gazette is kind of on, on shaky ground anyway. So. Oh yeah. So I saw. Yeah. Oof. Okay, okay. Shall we um, move on? Any more questions for Adam? Just, a, I was just going to say about the Gazette. Um, I, it would be really interesting um, to have some high school students do some maybe guest editorials where they could report from the front lines of what it's been like for them to transition to being um, online learners. And um, I, I don't know which high school classes have journalism cl courses. I'm not that familiar with the with the curriculum, but I think that would be really interesting. Mm, Hazen does. I know is this Crassberry? I'm not sure. Okay. Cool. Um, one other item, Adam. I was curious uh, how the Go Guardian uh, implementation is going. Mentioned a huge increase in tickets, and you're kind of configuring things. Yeah, we haven't um, we haven't implemented that yet. Dave, are you still here? I'm still here. Yeah. Well, we yeah, have there's we have kind of implemented it. We're using Securely and Go Guardian both right now because um, we're still on the trial, and I just had them extend the trial. We just got the paperwork from MLC. I got a finish go over that make sure everything's all set we'll get that along next week and we'll be good to go um it's much better than what we had before and it, it it's really working good and we're fortunate because we had devices going home a lot of these schools didn't have devices going home so they have no idea how to do content filtering remotely so we were way ahead of the curve that way too and is that where most of the tickets are coming from dave no or um, you know, we still get our suicide alerts and things like that, but a lot of the tickets are, how do I do this? Or I found this new device, uh, this new software or this new program. How do I use it? Things like that. Just teachers needing help. And it's nice that the teachers are actually putting in help too. Um, one thing about the internet is we've helped oh, probably half a dozen families get internet, free internet. Um, VTEL, Comcast and Consolidated have all stepped up. So some people are taking advantage of that. Cool, great, thank you. If I might add, can I add something to that, Amy? Sure. <clears throat> um, I'm all, we're also, Dave Martin and I are working with um, some teacher leaders because there's some common threads of some of the questionings that are coming through the tech tickets. And so we're gonna be putting together some mini workshops for teachers on like Schoology or um, a platform called Seesaw for the elementary students or just Google Classrooms. So we're going to be offering those workshops um, right after uh, the vacation week for anyone and hopefully that'll eliminate some of the tickets that are coming in around specific platforms. Cool. Great. Thanks, Amy. Mm -hmm. uh, nothing else. Shall we move on? Um, so we are going to talk about um, the continuous improvement plan, developmental designs and project aware. Um, and I just want to say before I turn it over, Amy, are you talking about the continuous improvement plan? I will be. Okay, before you start that, I just wanted to say I've spent um, more than a few hours this afternoon reading all of the materials um, in the board folder. And um, thank you COVID-19 for giving me time to do that. Um, <laughs> But I wanted to say how impressed I am um, by the kind of amount of work that's been done con considering all of the sort of shifts and transitions, a new superintendent and Amy, you're in a new position and had to learn that. And we've got these two grants, the AWARE grant and the equity grant. And I think a whole lot of um, work was placed on you. And I, I think that these documents really illustrate just how 
um, hard you all been working. So I want to say thank you very, 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 very much. So I'm going to tee you up. Amy, you wanted to go and give us something on that? Sit. Sure, I'll start with the continuous improvement plan. So this is done yearly. <clears throat> um, it's a requirement uh, by the AOE. And typically we would include a comprehensive needs assessment, which for me coming into this new position, I felt like we were in ongoing comprehensive needs assessment the whole year, which is really a beautiful thing, quite honestly, because then you're not waiting until just um, February, March to kind of pull your, um, your resources and figure out what's working and what's not working. So this is this document has been ongoing since I came into my position this year and with the development of the equity leadership team and the MTSS team and the leadership team and all these other parts and pieces, the mentoring committees that I formed, the coalition, the uh, community partners coalition, and then just the general school visits that I go to um, on a bi-weekly uh, basis. What I felt this document needs to be, uh, it's a little different than ones in the past. So if you've read OSSU SIPs in the past, they um, have tended to be um, a bunch of, of general data and then maybe a, a couple change ideas. And I really believe, I feel strongly that our continuous improvement plan needs to really reflect how everything ties together and that it's not just a couple things that we're working on in change. We're working on lots of things, and I really feel strongly that it needs to be comprehensive and laid out in this plan. So um, I've tried to encompass everything that we're working on. I read through it again today because I've been working on this for um, several weeks now, and I, I even picked up on a few things I think that maybe it's a little light on. So I was really looking for some feedback from you folks on what makes sense, what doesn't make sense, what are we missing, um, any, any feedback that you can give me before I submit this. The process is that I would submit the OSSU continuous improvement, um, and I have a data tool that I have to complete as well that goes with it. And um, once that gets approval, then each school has to submit their individual school continuous improvement, and it needs to align with the OSSU plan. Mm -hmm. um, and then when all of those things are approved, then I can write investments for the next year's uh, uh, consolidated grant. So it's kind of uh, the next few months, all my, a lot of my work will be really be focusing on what are we doing, where are our needs, where are our strengths, and what do I need to build into this uh, consolidated grant for next year. So that's kind of the process. One thing that you probably noticed as you read through it is that the data is very light in this report. And that, in part, is um, a couple of things. For one, SBAC data at the state level hasn't been disaggregated yet. So <laughs> that means that I can't, there's no way for me to look at it um, collectively for OSSU right now in different uh, categories which we typically would break that down. So I'm hoping that the data manager and I can go in and try to figure that out on our own because I have a feeling the state's not gonna focus on that right away. Mm -hmm. um, also, we had our field review back in November, I think you'll remember. They sent us a report. Um, there were some things in that that Adam and I felt we really needed to um, address with them before we would allow it to be finalized, and we haven't gotten a finalized report back from that yet. So we are waiting on some data, um, which makes it really hard. I'm, I'm thankful that I went through an ongoing process because I think we I had a lot of anecdotal data, but not a lot of hard data to support some of these things. Um, and then the other piece is that, you know, in writing this, it came at a time when we were in transition for a data manager, and that also has posed some problems. So I'm hoping to get you some hard um, data in the next month or so that will really support this, and then I will update my data tool as soon as I get the hard data. I just wanted to be really clear about that. It wasn't because we didn't I, I didn't make an effort to get it. It's just really hard to get it right now. The AOE is a little backed up on that. 
but um, really what I was hoping for today was just any feedback or uh, questions that you might have regarding this. I don't know if people all had a chance to look through it. Yeah, Amy, I, I looked through it last night and uh, made a few notes and comments I can share. I'd love um, that. Uh, I noticed increased mentoring was a big theme and some of the challenges around that. And I was just curious how much of that, you know, mentoring, leading, training is happening, you know, across districts or is it, you know, primarily within the schools? Like how much kind of inter OSSU mentoring is happening? Because it seemed like so one of the challenges mm -hmm. was just, uh, you know, maybe shortage of mentors and trainees and just kind of the numbers issue. It's a little bit of both, just to be. Um, so I've been working with the mentoring leadership team all year. Uh, we, this was something that we tackled right at the, I tackled last summer with them is uh, I've known just from being an employee within the OSSU that the mentoring program's got some issues both in the fact that we um, don't have a lot of mentor, mentee tours and we don't, and the mentees are feeling really stressed by the expectations of the mentoring program. So we're hoping to revamp the whole program, ease some of the burden on the on new teachers that come to our district, really hone in on what do they really specifically need, change some of the requirements, and really get them in seeing each other's classrooms more to start building community across the district. Um, and then we're looking at uh, Keen State offers uh, a mentoring support for, in particular, new teachers. And I'm looking into seeing if that's a viable option. It's very, it's fairly inexpensive. And it would give new teachers at the end of their first year of teaching a chance to have sort of a, a reflective practice for a week and look at where their strengths were, where their um, uh, areas of growth need to be, and help them develop their professional growth plan for the following school year. So that's something that a teacher, actually a new teacher to our district, brought up, and we're doing some research on that. So we're really looking at changing the whole format of it so that we can lessen some of the burden on mentors, lessen some of the burden on the mentees, and make it really more meaningful to them so that they want to engage in it. And does much mentoring happen between schools right now? Do you know? Yeah, typically, you would have... Um, you would have a mentor at every school location that would mentor the new teachers in that building. Okay. But part of the requirement is that they would have classroom observation. They have to do classroom mm -hmm. observations. And one thing that I've set up this year is for all, it doesn't even matter if you're a new teacher or not, but I, the expectation is that I want people to be getting into classrooms across the district. So I've set up multiple classroom visits and that's, a key component of this is really starting to build relationships across the SU, not just within the school that you work. Great. I had uh, another one. I don't sure. want to hog the time, so uh, don't let me do that, everyone. Um, there were a few references also to maybe an increased use of consultants which is an interesting idea. Me being one, I, I probably like that idea, but I was just curious how much, uh, not an education consultant, I, I'm not. Uh, mm -hmm. but I was just curious how much do we utilize consultants now for some of these kind of longer term, you know, planning um, exercises you were talking about. Is that something we do at all or is that, um, yeah, what, what do we do now with consultants? Uh, pr primarily we have literacy consultants. So we hire experts in the field to come and work with schools specifically or teachers specifically, depending on what the need is. So it's really school by school driven right now. Um, one of the things that we're really looking at is at the elementary level in particular, what are best practices in K, you know, in the elementary in particular, K2 around literacy mm -hmm. and seeing how to bring in consultants to work with those, but we're also looking at developing our own internal capacity for teacher leaders to do some coaching because we've got some great teachers in our system and those teachers could be consultants, if you will, um, mm -hmm. or coaches to other staff members. So 
Amy, to piggyback on what Casey's um, asked about, um, what I didn't see was sort of the relationship also between the equity work and the AWARE grant and the whole mental health stuff. And would we think about doing consultants around equity issues as well as mental health issues with kids? Actually, and that's interesting that you bring that up, Amy, because when I was rereading it today, I, I was feeling like it was really light around the equity pieces of it. Mm -hmm. And I think you're right on that. So I will, I will make sure that I address the equity work and project the relationship with Pro Project AWARE as well. I think it's light on that. Um, and it also would be helpful for those of us um, who have a phobia of acronyms um, to, to think about um, sort of fleshing out what we see as the ideal MTSS system. Um, because you mentioned sort of improving it, but it doesn't really say to do what? Like, to, how would it look different than, than it does now? What would be some of the changes that would have to be made to have it go from what it is now to what we want it to be? Um, I, I found that was a little general and I wanted to know more. And maybe that's not where it needs, doesn't need to be in this, the, the improvement plan, but it would be, I think something that we could measure if we knew what it is we wanted it to look like and to see. Um, that makes sense. If you look at goal two in the in this um, continuous improvement, it is around MTSS. Mm -hmm. So I've taken each of the components of MTSS, and that's our MTSS leadership team, um, which consists of many teachers and all the principals. We've really been focusing on these uh, primary areas, mm -hmm. and so I, anything that we had kind of fleshed out as need in those MTSS meetings, I've incorporated in um, in in these change ideas mm -hmm. uh, this section. Right. The MTSS field guide is something that's driving us on that, and I can share that with you all. It's a huge read, by the way, so I don't know if you want it or not, but that's really the Bible, the the, the guiding document for our work. Adam, is there anything more on that you want to add to that? Not sure. I'm trying to unmute myself. Um, yeah, I think uh, I'm just reading through your plan, and you've got a lot of those MTSS components in there. Um, you know, a comprehensive assessment system, the data. So things are sprinkled throughout that that are part of that larger uh, multi-tiered systems of support. So, it's just not sort of expressly tied to it. Um, but a lot of the things she has in there do align with it. So I guess for me, maybe this is just my need. It says to continue to grow and develop MTSS framework. Um, if there was a little more information about a framework that was, are we thinking that obviously each school will have a different framework, but are there components that every MTSS yeah, so there's there's a specified framework, and you have to remember your audience too. So the audience of this application is the agency of education who oh. knows all about MTSS. But that doesn't mean we can't, you know, do another night where Amy comes in and talks about the MTSS framework. And it is a framework, which is great because it's not it's not a program where uh, the state says you have every school has to do it this way. Instead, mm -hmm. it's sort of a structure or a skeleton upon which you're free to, to build, you know, a system that suits your culture. So um, the MTSS framework realized in Hazen could look very different from it realized at Craftsbury, given the culture and different needs. But I would say that under goal two, there are five change ideas that are in red, and those five are the OSSU non-negotiables. In other words, all schools must yeah. uh, develop a systematic and comprehensive approach, must have effective collaboration, must have high quality instruction and intervention, which are five key components under the MTSS framework. Mm -hmm. And so what we are doing is we're outlining how OSSU is going to put that, but each school is going to have their individual, what they're specifically working on in their SIPs mm -hmm. under each of those same five categories. Okay, thank you. Um, I was just um, thinking about um, the idea of time, and I know that we had discussed 
at our last in-person meeting, I can't remember when it was, but our last in-person meeting, um, it must have been January or maybe February, um, the idea that teachers need more time to collaborate and more time to meet with individual students. And I think right now, kind of amazingly, um, teachers are having the time to um, touch base individually with, with kids. And I saw that in your goal for time was listed as one of the um, objectives, but I just, I didn't know, is that, it said time in the school year, and I didn't know if we're talking about time in the school day for teachers to meet with kids. I, I just wondered if we could get more specific on, on that. That's a great point, Rose. Um, Primarily in this plan, I would say the time is specific to teacher collaboration. So PLC is happening, more time for teachers to connect with each other. But it doesn't reference a lot of time with teachers connecting with students. So let me go back and, and think about how I could pull that part in. I, I think that would be great. I think both are valuable. I think that would be great too. Thank you. Yeah. Any other comments? Uh, not, yeah, I think I had uh, one or two more, Casey, here. Okay. Um, I noticed there were no, um, no funding sources listed. And that's a tricky one. Do you <laughs> tend to think that these items can be funded from, you know, like our conventional, how we fund, you know, most of the school programs? Or are you thinking these are, you know, primarily funded by grants? And then second part to that, um, you know, maybe if sources are hard to come by, maybe putting dollar amounts, you know, next to some of these just to get, you know, just to kind of start estimating, like, what is this, what does this cost to, you know, fund this activity? Good noticing. Yeah, typically, um, many things in this document will be funded by the grants. So it is a, a, the bulk of, um, but not not in its entirety. There will be things that will be funded by uh, Project Aware. There'll be things that are be funded at the local level, because it can't all come from the grant for sure. So, um, I think it was just getting things outlined and figuring out what our priorities were, and then the next piece would be how are we going to fund it. So. That will be a piece that I put in here. When we put it in for the AOE, we really just have to list it very generically. Like I can under any one goal, I could list three or four funding sources that we're considering for paying for anything that might be needed in here. And then the partner document to this is the CFP, the Consolidated Funds Program application. And in it, Amy will be doing a lot of work where she specifies um, how much an investment costs, not just um, the full cost, but if it's personnel, for example, she'll have to put whatever stipend or salary, and then in a se totally separate area, the benefits, I mean, breaking it all out. Um, and that informs uh, IV, our financial software, so we can keep track of it all. But, but that's where all the details um, for the specific amounts go. Gotcha. Uh, last question I had was, uh, this was, I think, under parent engagement. Um, athletics can be a great gateway, um, just with, especially talking about, you know, cross-cutting groups in the community. It's just something that brings together uh, a diverse group. So, um, great point. Yeah, athletics. I was looking at um, the parent involvement goal number three. And I'm wondering, is there um, a title like goal three? It, it just doesn't have like the other one says school and, or culture and the other one says academic. What is goal three's? Parent community partner engagement. Parent community partner engagement. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. This feedback's been helpful. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. Any other questions, comments? Cool. Thank, thank you for your work on it. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Appreciate it. 
Um, all right. The next, oh, oops, lost my thumb. Developmental design. Adam, who's talking about that? I guess that would be me again. Oh, okay. Well, Sorry. Amy, and I give you Amy Massey again. Yeah. <laughs> so um, you'll see, I think I put this in the previous month's um, folder as well. But this, uh, this document that's in here really outlines um, there are links to all the different levels, but I wanted you to just kind of get a sense of generally what developmental designs is, and then at elementary, middle, and high school, how they can support um, our PBIS, our universal um, uh, instruction around both academics and com uh, climate and social-emotional learning. So, um, in general, this develop we when we met with developmental designs, they were one of two uh, partnerships that were presenting regarding how they could support us. Um, it was if you look at the second part of this document, you'll see some of the notes that administrators took um, regarding how it connects. So what we had done as administrators is kind of said, what do we want in an SEL program? How will it support us SU-wide? And really try to listen carefully for how it supported some of our big, bigger ticket ideas. And it just, they just really see, they're research-based. They, um, they just, they ticked all the boxes in terms of what what they can offer us to support us around social emotional learning and academic and culture building within a school system at all levels. Um, they work in conjunction with PBIS, which many of our schools are. They have a data collection um, protocol and progress monitoring piece. They have pieces that focus on goal setting and um, and then just the varying levels of support. So it, it really is, it seems like a comprehensive program. And, and, you know, our hope would be that we could get everybody trained at once, which is a big ask. Um, but that would be the, that would have the greatest impact on our school years if everyone could get the training that they need uh, in the following school year so that we could just move forward. And we're also looking for the capability to have um, to have train the trainer model so that we could sustain this with any new um, new hires after the following year. So we I've got some work to do to figure out how to make that all happen. Um, because as you can imagine, having a company come in or a, a program come in and deliver professional development to 300 staff all at once on the same day is a big ask. <laughs> um, but we are, we're getting closer and closer in figuring out how to make that happen. So do people have specific questions of, um, pertaining to developmental designs or, or why we chose this? So, development design is the name of a company, or is the name of an approach, or what? It's the name of a an approach. A pro, a pro, I don't know if it's a program. I wouldn't. Adam, would you say it's a program? I'd say probably approach. An approach, yeah. And is there a particular company that provides the training on this approach? And they're they are called what? <laughs> Uh, or I think it's called Origins, or is the name of their sort of company. They um, they came to light a, a person who once was a responsive classroom um, trainer, kind of went out on their own and did some research and really, uh, I think, created a really dynamic and an evolving um, business around this. They really. Rely, they update their information on a regular basis. And so I think as times are changing, their their approaches, their strategies that they're uh, employing with staff are changing as well. And I yeah, think that's what really impressed us the most. Yeah, developmental, or sorry, um, responsive classroom was sort of the original 
Um, but our assessment was they kind of remained a little static. Um, still a really good program, and uh, a lot of our elementary school teachers have been trained in it um, some a while back. So uh, part of this model we've been talking about, you know, when, when would, it, would a refresher be expected? Uh, maybe every three years people go through a refresher workshop. Mm -hmm. And what's the and do, Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead, Rose. I was just wondering, do we have teachers who are already trained in it or who have already been to these conferences or been to these sessions or have um, studied it as part of their master's programs or? Um, yeah, the, the Hazen. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. yeah. The Hazen, say again. Adam. Oh, the Hazen Middle School team was trained in it over the uh, the last uh, summer. Yeah. Mm. But in terms of Great. like this has, I thought it had a reference to PBIS in it. I mean, is this something that we feel like has been working for the most part or is this a brand new, I mean, responsive classroom is something I've heard before, which if this is sort of an offshoot of it, I'm just curious to know if we feel specifically for the, when children misbehave, we help children find pathways to self-control. Do we feel like that's been effective in what we've been doing thus far when people get up when children get up to the element or the middle school and high school level do we feel like what they've been getting in the elementary school is actually helping them in their learning the self-control so part of the issue is there's been a disconnect um for the most part elementary school teachers are good about teaching these uh these protocols and these practices but um there's suddenly a drop off in middle school where, um, you know, the middle school teachers really don't know what the the elementary school teachers have been working on. And, and that's not their fault. It's just the, you know, the siloed model that we have. But one of the things that attracted us to this approach was that it's pre-K through 12. So getting everyone trained in it ensures that there's a scaffolded model and kids are um, you know, teachers are emphasizing this through the grade levels and kids are still focusing on it in middle and high school. I think it will also, this program better complements the PBIS approach and it will actually maybe strengthen the PBIS systems that schools have in place already um, because it relies heavily on that universal level instruction. So all kids are expected to have universal instruction, which is the same as PBIS, but it's really, um, I think it's, it's, it's so much a critical part of what developmental designs, strategies and, and approaches bring is that we focus on it and we, we keep revisiting that. We do the reteaching, we have the, the layer, the teaching, the tiers of instruction and supports um, and it builds off from the same, a lot of the same uh, premises of PBIS, but I think PBIS maybe is a little, um, has, has kind of faded away a bit in some of the schools. So I'm hoping that this will kind of bring that back and kind of bolster both programs at the same time. Uh, Amy? Steve Freyhofner here. Yeah. Uh, I'm looking at the uh, first page on the high school column and the last paragraph under the uh, highlighted promoting proactive social and emotional agency, there is the word antidote. I guess I'm not quite sure what that word means in the context of that paragraph. Can you explain that? Um, you know, I'm not sure that I can, Steve. Um, I, I would also encourage you maybe to, at the top where it says high school, to click on the link there, and that would actually bring us right into high, the high school developmental designs uh, approach. All right, um, I'll do that. I don't know if that'll answer your question. I'm sorry, I don't know. You know, I'll be learning this right along with everyone. 
Um, I'm, this is not an approach that I'm from, like that I've been engaged in um, prior either. So, all right. I just want to explain the reason I'm asking is because yeah. the sentence reads what it does in the highlighted part, yep. promoting proactive social and emotional agency for all high school students as a necessary antidote for future achievements uh, mm -hmm. of their goals. Do, you, do we really want an antidote mm. for that accomplishment? I don't yeah. think so. Probably. Maybe maybe you mean antecedent. Mm. So I don't know how this, who wrote this, but I think maybe the choice of words there could make a difference. Yeah. Um, I did not write it. I took it right from the high school page, so I can go back on and try to find that. Okay, if if you if you do look at that, maybe antecedent would be more yeah. appropriate. Yeah. Would that make more sense there? You think? I think it could. I think somebody somebody had COVID on the brain. <laughs> <laughs> There's been a lot of things on the brain lately. <laughs> It's very likely that I could have made a mistake. We all need an antidote, so maybe it was that. Well, I used the word ingredient, but that's only because I'm sitting in my kitchen. Um, <laughs> so I'm going to ask my question, how much does a, a training course cost? I can't believe I'm asking the money question, but. <laughs> so, um, you know, it's actually in the scope of things. Um, I think it's going to average out to be about $900 per teacher for a year's worth of training and coaching. Right. Or not just teacher. I'm sorry. Staff member, because we're looking at getting um, support staff also trained in this. That means using uh, all four of our in-service days in addition to uh, coaching uh, outside of those days. And is it the kind of thing where some people could get trained and then those people train other people or does every single person um, attend the original training? Just to, Everybody just gets training, the same training at different levels. So elementary, middle and high school, everybody gets that training. And then as um, they're doing, so they would, they also come in and do some observations of people, implementation of it. And in, right in that first visit, they're hoping to identify staff that would make good candidates for um, train the trainer coaches for future coaching. And they want to identify those right away. And then those individuals, if willing, would get a little more in-depth training so that they could know how to train the trainer. Yep. They I felt just, I just kinda... that it wasn't just us choosing who those um, teacher leaders would be, though. They really wanted to put their expert eyes on it and look for key components that they look for. Um, and and I, I think that's a really wise model that yeah. together we collaborate to figure out who are our best people to be moving this forward. I just had one more question. Um, do we know other local schools that have already implemented developmental design? And could we have, I mean, not right now, but could we at some point have um, visits where our teachers got to see um, see this in action in a, in a local school? That's a great question. Um, you know, I think Justine Guthrie, the principal at Lakeview, really is a huge advocate of this. And I think the school that she was at, which is Berry City, I think, I forget where she was, um, is was using this approach as well. So I think we could easily, I think that's a great idea, by the way, to tap into schools that are using it. And I would ha happily set up visits so that we could also see teachers at other schools implementing the same thing. So I think that's a great I'll bring this to Rutland so we can uh, go down there as well. Um, there are a number of schools in the Rutland area. I've already talked to folks about visiting them. Great.
So you're just informing us. We, we don't have any control over this, do we? <laughs> Correct. I'm just informing you. You don't need to make any decisions. All right. Cool. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions, comments? Thanks, Amy. Appreciate it. Um, and Heather's next up. Heather, are you still with us? I am. I've been here the whole time. Um, <laughs> just listening and waiting. So just before I start, I'm actually going to um, share my presentation screen with you all so that you could have access to what I am talking about. Okay. Hold on, trying to move it over a little bit. Okay, can folks see the Vermont Project Aware page? Yep. Great. So first of all, I just want to say thanks for inviting me to share about the Project Aware grant. Um, keep in mind, this is a partnership between Vermont Agency of Education and Services and the Department of Mental Health. So this is not a grant that OSFU actively sought. This was a grant that was sought um, on our behalf. So, what AWARE? Um, AWARE stands for Advancing Wellness and Resilience in Education. And um, the anecdotal story to this is that in about May of two, it was April or May of 2018, my colleague at Memorial County Mental Health called me and said, hey, you know, we work really well together. We both have similar goals and, um, you know, hopes and wishes for our, our families and our communities and our students. And, you know, would you be willing to partner on a grant with us? And I was like, yeah, well, of course, why wouldn't I? And uh, she said, well, it's not really us. It's really the Agency of Education and the Department of Mental Health. Didn't really know a lot about it um, in then, in 2018, but quickly learned and was contacted by the AOE at that time. And they said, okay, we want to do this. We want to we want to apply for this grant to the um, Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration at the federal level. And, you know, it would be a five-year grant for $8.2 million. And we, it would be for three SU in the state of Vermont, OSSU being one of them, Rutland County being the second, and the third was Addison Rutland County. So they did, they applied for it. The grant was awarded in September of 2018 to the AOE. But as all things grants and federal, um, it was, it took a while to sort of get things going. So we had a couple of meetings. The AOE was trying to understand what it was really all about. I was on medical leave um, last year during this time and, and there wasn't much happening anyway from the state level. I mean, they were doing things at the state level, but there wasn't much need for us as a few to be involved yet. So we really didn't start to come back together until spring of 2019 around this grant. Um, so why? We always have to think about why, what is the purpose? Why did Vermont want to apply for this grant? What the things that they noticed at the state level is that younger students were struggling, are struggling with emotional distress, behavior outbursts. We see that in our schools as well. Um, that older students have anxiety and depression and relationships, and all of this impacts students' ability and readiness to learn. We noticed um, again, state level was noticing this, but we certainly can can speak from our perspective in OSSU that families are stressed, um, and there's a wide variety uh, of variants in their involvement with school and mental health services. Um, we know that teachers are managing so many student needs, and right now, with COVID-19, obviously, it's just it's just ballooned um, exponentially. And um, so in the classroom and just so many initiatives and so many different things being thrown at teachers and so many are really feeling this uh, initiative and empathy fatigue. 
Um, and finally, uh, Vermont decided to apply for this grant because they had those partnerships between supervisory unions and mental health agencies already, and those leaders were really working together and interested in, in making a greater impact and using our resources more efficiently. So how are we gonna get there? Um, what is the process for Project AWARE? Oh, <laughs> the critical the success of Project AWARE is this interconnected system framework um, and MTSS, multi-tiered system of support. So if you look at the triangle that has um, the school districts at the pinnacle of it, and that's a typical MTSS system where the, the, the largest part is the universal supports and services in um, at the universal level, which we say in education, in um, academic support, that's where, you know, general classroom instruction is happening. And that's for everybody. But there's typically around um, 15 to 20% of the kids that may not be able to access the instruction as it is um, provided universally. So maybe 15 to 20% of those kids need a more targeted support small group work, something like that. Um, and this is, again, in a, in a multi-tiered system of support. And then three to five percent of those kids may, or three to five percent of those students may not still be able to access with those targeted supports, and they need really um, high intensity, high frequency intensive support at that tier three level. What the integrated system uh, interconnected systems framework tries to do is flip that triangle upside down with mental health services so that the, the, the highest need kids are getting actually more mental health support than they were before and the you know the at the universal level we're still maintaining those some of those universal supports that we have um, but just to make it a more robust um, efficient and effective system like I said sort of flipping that triangle upside down so the goal here really is to blend our resources across agencies, mental health agencies and schools, um, blend our training, our systems, our data collection, our practices, and you know, in order to improve the outcomes for our children and, and the youth in our care. So what does this look like for Project AWARE um, in Vermont? Uh, excuse me, in OSFU. So in February of 2019, when we finally started to come back together, they had said, you know, we got the grant, but you need to take a pilot school. Your pilot school has to be a PBIS school already because PBIS is, a ten, you know, an essential tenant of the interconnected system framework. Um, we were told we had to submit our first year budget and proposal in April of 2019. So we pulled together a group of stakeholders um, that we said, okay, we have this grant opportunity. We don't know a lot about it, but we'd like to pull you all together hard with our pilot school. How, do, how can we, how can we use the, these funds? How can we think creatively and do something different? And we based our proposal and our budget on, on that. Um, so the following activities are really what came out of our proposal. One of the requirements for um, at, at being awarded the grant is that we had to hire a grant coordinator. So in September of 2019, when the, the AOE finally said, yep, your grant is approved, you have the money, we could go ahead and we hired um, Grant Mexdale, Mike Sola as our, our, our grant coordinator. Um, he's got a master's degree in mental health and a master's degree in education. So in my opinion, it was a perfect fit to say somebody that understands education but also has that mental health background and can really help us bridge that gap. Um, the other sort of have to with this grant is that we have to contract with our designated agency, which is Memorial County Mental Health, and um, hire an, a project aware clinician. Because the funding and how we can use the funding has been so tricky, and because of Department of Mental Health funding stream, it's been really complicated to hire that role. Um, mental health clinicians currently very well. Um, and it was, it, it, it's a lot of trying to navigate that piece and trying to figure out, making sure we have the right person for this position. So that, that process is still ongoing. Um, we did decide to put the project coordinator at the, the pilot school to start building connections with the hardware staff and the students. 
Um, that person has also been, Grant has also been building relationships with the uh, Project Aware core team, as well as all the school staff and teachers and offering supports and services. Um, he has also been participating in the local interagency networking team meetings, which are Lamoille Valley um, network meetings, which has, is, a, again, a community of partners that work together to, you know, look at housing for individuals in the Mile Valley, food insecurity, um, the great overall system of care, mental health issues, and two sort of specific um, issues across the Mile Valley. And um, building that network is and one of the other things, and this is where um, the, the questions start coming, is like, well, what is the current, like, what is the baseline data? Like, how do we know where we are currently? And that's one of the, the tasks that the coordinator is tasked with figuring out is how do we, how do we start collecting that baseline data? And we do have partners um, at the state. The state, we don't get that whole $8 to $2 million. We only get a fraction of that split between the three SUs because the state has in, in, um, uh, enlisted vendors to actually do some of that data collection with us and for us. Heather? Heather, have we lost you? I think we may have lost you. Would it help if we all took our videos off, Adam? That's a good question. We could try. Can you hear me now? <laughs> yeah. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay. Yes. Yeah. yeah, much better. Sorry about that. It was uh, my, my earphones, I think, died, and so it mutes my, my speaker when that happens. All right, so let's see if I can get back into um, the presentation. Okay, so um, do, 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 do. don't know where uh, the, the state held their um, statewide kickoff event, not until January 14th of 2020. So you can already see we're almost two years into this project and we're not really technically you know in year one yet <laughs> right we really haven't sort of engaged in the activities that we need to um so the 14th of january was the statewide kickoff event which 14 of our our partners and our staff from ossu attended and then on january 30th we created the OSSU rollout event, and that is a picture of the rollout event um, held in Stowe. We had about 25 folks attend, and that was the creation of what is called our district community leadership team, and their responsibilities, and I'll talk about it more in the next slide. Um, their team, their, the, the purpose of the district community leadership team is really to help us oversee the process and provide a community voice for decision making. So there's two teams on how the work will get done. The district community leadership team, they will meet monthly. Uh, we're just having our, our, our second sort of come together meeting this Friday. And um, then the core team who's meeting, was meeting on a weekly basis since February, to sort of spearhead the work and work through these um, exploration and installation phases of this project. There is a 400 page manuscript, um, not, not sorry, not manuscript, it's called a monograph uh, that really outlines these different phases and the work that needs to get done. So we don't need or want to have 25 people trying to dig into that. We feel like it's our responsibility as a core team to dig into that and then ask the district community leadership team for help in the things that we need to get done. So who are the core team members? It's myself as the director of student services. We have Katina Idol, who worked for County Mental Health as the school-based coordinator. We have Alexis Izzo, who's our uh, coordinator of behavior services at the SU. We have Grant 
Mike Zoll, who's our LEA Community Coordinator for Project AWARE. We have Kim Asim, she's the Regional Director for NFI, but she also is um, a PBIS, she works for Vermont PBIS, so she brings the PBI perspective, but she also helps to bring the trauma-informed perspective. And then of course we have Pat Pennick, who's our principal at Hardwick, which is our, our pilot school. So that's sort of the direction that we're moving in right before the school closures. <laughs> the, the core team was really excited to start moving into the installation phase, which means doing the in initiative inventory and the staff utilization review. And these are again, tools that are provided to us by Midwest PBIS and sort of help drive this work. Um, now that schools are closed, it's gonna make it more challenging, but it doesn't mean the work is gonna go away. We're, we're committed, we've met um, two times now since school closures and we've said like this work has to continue and now probably more than ever, it's really critical that we figure out how to do things differently because we really need to make sure that we're we're meeting the needs. Um, and I think things are only going to get more difficult for kids and families as we become, we have to stay more isolated. And the, the team agrees. So what, what are we hoping is the result of all of this? Um, these are the goals as written by the Agency of Education to promote ongoing collaboration at the state and local level regarding best practices. And again, to it's about increasing awareness of mental health issues enhancing wellness and resi resiliency skills for school-aged youth, and support system improvements for school-based mental health services. I think quite honestly, you know, Department of Mental Health is thinking if if we could use the, the you know, the, this grant opportunity and the, the creativity and the um, collaboration of these three SUs to, to think like differently on how we could provide better services, more efficient resources, then maybe it could actually push um, policy level change at the state level. And, you know, and, and, and again, really, I think we're sort of um, hindered a lot by the mental health funding system. So they're hoping that we can change that. How else do we see it? We see it as an opportunity. Like this is a chance for us to test out some new approaches. Um, the way the way in which we work together across these agencies to address mental health issues um, in our schools and in our communities. Uh -huh. So the the final thought I'll leave you with is um, these are the bigger picture questions. So does it benefit students and families when they intentionally embed school-based mental health, uh, excuse me, intentionally embed mental health into the school system using a structured and a teaming approach? When they receive training and coaching on child mental health topics like suicide prevention, trauma responsive schools, uh, et cetera. Do, does it benefit students, families, and schools when they include youth and family voice in the planning implementation of mental health school activities? And does it benefit when they have access to screening, brief intervention, and referral and crisis support? So these are the questions that we're looking to basically answer with this grant. And again, it's not just OSSU, we're being guided by the State Agency of Education and the Vermont Department of Health. So I think that was a little longer than 10 minutes and I apologize. Hope you could hear it okay. Cool. Anybody have any questions? Gordon, I think I sort of answered your question around... Um, yeah, Heather, um, you you touched on the topic of baselining the data mm -hmm. and, um, and looking at how we're measuring things. And um, so I think that's, uh, uh, I, I don't need to talk, and talk further about it. Okay, um, great. I just want to make sure you felt like it was answered. Yeah. Just I, I, digesting the presentation and, and uh, um, so what I'm taking away from all of this is that we're kind of, we're the experiment. We're one of, one of three SQs that is the experiment. And the basic, the idea is it, that 
we can improve overall delivery of, of necessary mental health services um, or, you know, improve the health of our communities overall and, and the mental health of our communities and, and better allocate the resources that we spend on mental health overall if we have close coordination between the school system and the mental health system um, and try and make sure that we're allocating, you know, that the, the mental health system is is doing the heavy lifting for individuals when they need it. That's those inverted, the inverted triangle. And the school, the school system is, is consciously, um, consciously supporting the mental health, mental, you know, sort of basic needs, um, uh, lightweight mental health needs throughout the entire community. Right. Yep. So, so um, is there a phase in this whole project? Uh, like right now you're, you're baseline and collecting data, um, if I understand correctly. And then I would assume that there will be a phase wherein you essentially implement this, you know, the, the model that's depicted in these triangles, you will implement it, I guess, at Hardwick Elementary. Um, yeah, yeah. So the the basic idea is is to um, we are going through these inventories and these tools and collecting this baseline data to, you know, the plan is to um, submit our year two proposal and budget. We we have anecdotal data and in conversations with the Hardwick staff, what we are learning is that, you know, what would be really has to have a teacher, a social emotional learning teacher that could support not only te um, teachers be a, a sort of a, a coach to the, the classroom teachers around things like developmental designs and um, PBIS because because it's so much going on, but furthermore, they could be a support for um, students and do some of that explicit instruction in social emotional, you know, higher intensity um, skills, self-regulation, zones of regulation, things like that, but, but also a larger uh, um, partnership with the school-based mental health clinician, right? Because we have a school-based mental health clinician, but because of their funding model, they're only, you know, they can only see so many kids and they have to, they have to make sure they see that number of kids for X number of hours a week um, in order to bill Medicaid or draw down those Medicaid funds, which makes it really affordable for schools under this project. We're, we're thinking about how can we redesign that school-based clinician because, you know, to, to, have them see more kids or be more helpful, like you said, like really be able to target those kids that we really need to, um, which, you know, is is more than typically schools can actually pay for. Hmm. So, yeah, I think that that's a, a perfect. Um, and, and so that's one of the things like we're as a core team. We're moving ahead and hoping that the the and, and guessing that the implementation um, the tools, the initiative inventory, and the the staff utilization review are going to prove what we've sort of gleaned anecdotally. But with the timing of it, the budget's not due until May, and you know what? We 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 want to move forward, and I think this is our opportunity to again try some things out um, that Hardwick says. I, I think this could work. The other piece is that we are supposed to be expanding. Um, to an additional school each year what I've gotten I've uh, originally they said no you can't focus on Hardwick and Lakeview and Woodbury because they're three separate schools but I've gotten them to approve us focusing on OSUD as a district next year so the the work can um, be replicated to the best of our ability with Hardwick still being our pilot school but with Woodbury and and Lakeview as well so I'm really excited about that um, cool. That's really Thank great. You. Thanks uh, for doing that. Yeah, it's no. It just made sense to me, and I don't think they realized. <laughs> I, I said they just recently merged. They are one school district. We should be able to focus on all three, like all three communities. Um, so yeah, I was really excited that they they finally approved that. Oh, that's good. So, so, so this is a five year program, and and we're coming to the end of year one. Yeah, it's actually really sad because we're actually, we're in like, oh, technically from the AOE standards, they're in like year, they're coming to the end of year two, right? Like September 
2020 will be the end of their second year. Yet our our grant is supposed to be awarded fiscal year. So we have our year one at 1920. Um, and then our year two will be 2021. Um, so again, we don't really know how it's going to shake out as far as will we get back those first two years. Um, we had requested the rollover funds from the first year because the original design team really had hoped to build a um, like a family sort of like a satellite mental health clinic um, in our community so that we could really support kids and families here. Uh, I think, you know, OSSU is very unique. And I think I've said this before and stop me if I'm going into too much detail, but because we're in four different counties, you know, Lamoille County Mental Health covers us for our children's services. So as long as they're in school, they can get services through Lamoille County Mental Health. Yet, if you have a parent or an older sibling who is, you know, out of school, then they typically have to go to the mental health agency that they, in the county where they live. So you could have a kid being served through Lamoille County Mental Health, but a parent and an older sibling being served through Northeast Kingdom Human Services, which makes it really tricky for things like family therapy. Um, so... Those are the kinds of barriers and obstacles that we're trying to to mitigate um, through this this grant. Heather, is there a plan to eventually um, introduce it into all the schools in the SU? Yeah, what maybe it's me and my rose-colored lenses, um, but I, I I don't see this just for like Hardwick, Osud, and you know one or two other schools if we can get that far in the grant. I see this as us being able to test some things out and try some things and, and present some models that could be used across Lamoille Valley. Um, I have a really close partnership with Lamoille North and Lamoille South, and my messaging to them has consistently been like, just because I'm the recipient of this grant doesn't mean I don't want to take back what, what we're doing in order to help you and your systems. Um, and we do share so many kids anyway. So yeah, my my hope is that I guess it's always going to have to be um, individualized to the uniqueness of each school. But if we could create some sort of basic model that helps to change the funding system and can make things more efficient and better for our communities, I say that's a win-win for everybody um, in Lamoille Valley. And you know what? Maybe in <laughs> in the state. I mean, I think the state is certainly hopeful that we will we will really try some new things that. Um, and, you know, just can make some positive change. I guess I don't want to change, you know, the entire world yet. I was just thinking about if it does well in the OSU model, will it get to Wolk at Craftsbury and Hazen? Yeah, I mean, if it doesn't, if it doesn't technically under the project aware, my, my hope would be that I could have that information. And, and the other piece to this is that the district community leadership team is an intentionally made up of um, stakeholders from across the SU. So I didn't want to just have Hardwick staff on the district le leadership community team. I have staff from Hazen and Craftsbury and Wolcott and Woodbury and Lakeview as well. Great. Thank you. Yeah, no Heather, problem. Yep. Um, I was, this is Catherine. I was wondering, um, I'm sure that there has been conversation about uh, just the mental health aspect of what's currently happening. And I'm, curious to know if that fits into the project aware or if it doesn't have really the flexibility to deal with sort of when we come back from this sort of the potential fallout I mean I'm imagining that teachers depending on when we come back to school uh, that there's sort of like this understanding that there will have to be some kind of like acknowledgement of what happened and processing of it and yeah. But I don't know if that if that applies to this or if that's if this is like so totally separate or if it can be worked into it. It absolutely applies. And honestly, even before we get back right now, I mean, what the state level folks are continually um, checking in with us about is and to be honest, I just had a meeting on Friday with um, one of the state level folks about it and and her 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 um, her sort of message to me was 
tell us what you need. How can we use this grant to be helpful to you and your school systems right now? Because obviously we can't do exactly what the grant, you know, said it was what, what we should be doing, but we can provide that level of support now to the best of our ability and, and be useful however you want. Um, so I think they're, or they're chomping at the bit to, to reach out. And, and I mean, it's, <laughs> I think that support needs to be there now. And to that effect, our grant coordinator is reaching out to Pat and um, and the teachers at Hardwick just to say, hey, you know what? This is really hard. Like this is an adjustment. What can I do to help you? And being a, a mental health clinician himself, it's a it's a it's a perfect uh, opportunity and a perfect use of his time. Quite honestly, um, to to provide that level of support. So yeah, I think I I don't see that changing when we go back to school. I think we can start it now and continue it then. Great. Thank you, Heather. You bet. All right. Are there any other questions for Heather? Hearing none. Thank you, Heather. Oh, no problem. Thank you for giving me the time to share. All right. David Martin, you're up. I need approval to do our tech lease. Normally, this is money that's already been budgeted in all the schools. Um, it's for Chromebooks, replacement things like servers. Um, Normally, I don't come to you guys until May and do this, but with all the disruption in production overseas, we might not be able to get what we want for devices. So I'm trying to do the lease now, put it out for bid. Um, some of these things might not come until six, six months from now, so I, I just don't know. Um, we did take what was left out of the tech budget. We didn't totally drain it, but we took some of the money that was left in there and we bought replacement Chromebooks because the kids taking them home, some of them are breaking quicker than I'd like. So we bought another 75 Chromebooks for spares, which will go back into the fleet. Um, one thing about this lease, it's a little more than it was last year, but we're, we're replacing our servers. Some of our servers are running 2008, 2012. We're going to make um, everything virtual, which will be much better for us. We're gonna have a network. Gordon, you might know what I'm talking about. We're going to make a network address storage. We already have this for cameras, but we're going to put our servers on a network address storage box called the NAS box and have two servers that actually are hosts that control the NAS box. And you can put as many virtual servers on there as you'd like. So the total for the lease is $201,000 and $201,000. Um, like I said, the money's in the budget, but I just need board approval to move forward with it. So that's what I'm looking to get tonight. Okay. Okay. Any questions, comments? It's a three-year lease. Um, Everything goes out for RFP, um, including the Chromebooks. Um, and then once we get the lowest bidder back, that's usually who we buy from. Okay. Rose, did you have a comment? Yeah, I was just wondering, um, is there not a freeze on on that part of the budget right now? Not that I'm aware of. This is this is for next year. It's next year's budget. Oh, I, uh, so it's looking at next year's budget, but you order it now so that you can have the lease and also you're looking at the actual equipment. Correct. A lot of the times, got it. We can't wait till July one to make purchases. So what we do is we try to do the lease ahead of time. If I wait till July one and I do all my orders and everything on July one, I won't get things here in time to get configured before August. No, so that makes sense. Yeah. Okay. Anybody else? All right. Are we ready to? Does someone want to um, make a motion that we approve this lease? So moved. I'll make that motion. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> We've got a delay. I'll second it. Okay, um, everybody unmute yourselves, please. And all those in favor of approving the lease, indicate by saying aye. 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 All those opposed? Aye. Oh, <laughs> all those opposed, say nay. Abstentions? Perfect. All right, it's approved. Thanks, David. Thank you, everybody. All right. Um, the next order of business is, um, this consent agenda. You guys um, see me on anymore? Can I 
bail. No, you can go away. Thank okay. You. Thank you. Everybody have a great night. You, you too. too. Thank you. Time. Sure. Thank you. Um, the approve the monthly financial narrative with budget adjustments and then approve the vouchers. Um, we all, all everyone take a look at the, so Adam, is, is it the fact that we're 200 and some odd thousand dollars like overspent? Um, where is that from? Well, let me look at the, um, document there is that ossu march fy20 yes yes <clears throat> so where are you looking um right. looks like you've spent um uh 103 percent right your budgeted expenses and that might be because there's that might be because there's certain revenue that hasn't come in yet Right, but our projective revenue is eight million. This is so tiny, I need to make it bigger. Um, eight million nine seven seven, and we've spent oh hold on. Where was I looking? It looks like we've received seventy seven percent of our revenue oh, okay. 30, uh, 23 outstanding but we spent 103 percent of our expenses right we were three percent over yeah and i'd have to ask john what what the cause of that is unless he's got it in his notes i for some reason i can't load anything but page one uh, can you see the, his notes that he puts at the end of that? Yeah. Um, I'm having trouble loading it also. So it says that we've, our net expenses is 9.271, 9,271,598, with, with a deficit of 294,457. Um, So, so I'm looking at his notes. He says, uh, purchase services are billed post consumption of the services. So this will always lag in receiving of revenue, but we'll catch up by the end of the fiscal year. Oh, salaries for professional staff are higher than budget. Mm -hmm. This is due to significant staff turnover year over year. And the staff that was secured for the, this fiscal year is more seasoned than was budgeted. Right. It looks like it, there's, it's, um, it's the green, the variance that we're over. So this is communications, travel reimbursement, some tuition, independent private schools, supplies, technology related software. Um, their salary is 41,000 in salary. So if you look at professional staff for 244,000 in the whole, then that's, that was he, what he was saying about, um, a more experienced mm -hmm. staff. So that's a big chunk right there. Also, um, it looks like mm -hmm. health insurance. Adam, where are you? Where are you seeing this? Is this on the second page? I'm on. Let's see. Um, one, two, three, four, uh, five. Five is where I can see the salaries. The list of notes is on uh, page eight for yeah. the expense notes. Yeah, tuition is high. Let's see, expense note eight. 
student needs changed and where we budgeted for our out of district placements in state ended up being out of state to meet the needs of the students. Mm -hmm. Oh, this is we budgeted nothing and, and we've spent three hundred eleven thousand. Is that what we're we're looking at? It looks like um look at the next slide as well, it. right? Because we saved one hundred and eight thousand um on in state, but we're spending three hundred thousand on out of state. Right. Can I yeah, can I also speak to um I can speak to some of those costs a lot of times <laughs> more often than you would think anyway um the state has sent students to out of district out of state placements which we're not paying for and uh -huh. then we get a notice about a maybe a month before saying oh by the way the student is ready to come back and you're the lea so you now have to pay for an appropriate educational setting lots of times it's not the public high school that's the appropriate educational setting or the public you know elementary school or whatever a lots of times it's a it's a private independent school that is the most appropriate setting so that's again a cost that we don't necessarily know of when we're budgeting a year in advance um, we don't know when these kids are going to be ready or when they're going to go to these sure. out-of-state placements so, so Heather, what input did we have in placing that student none you're saying it's, well, there's some cases where we do have, um, we do have ultimate place for for those out of district placements because we're saying we've tried everything we can, and sometimes in state we've tried everything we can, but there are not needs. There are needs that are far greater than we can handle. 99% of the time, that goes through the coordinated services plan and the lit process, which takes us takes us out out of having to pay for that but sometimes it's not about the mental health issues it's really about what the student needs and what we don't have to offer in vermont um so it's it's hard to say um you know but there are times where we don't have control over where where those kids will land when they come back and what we're going to be responsible for what placements okay Okay, are there any other questions about that? Not specifically on any one line item, but um, you know, in years past, uh, if, I'm, if my memory serves, uh, by this time we're starting to see, uh, you know, John would be providing some kind of projection as to where we might land at, at the end of the year. And so mm -hmm. seeing us three, almost $300,000 over on our expenses, um, and looking at note number two, that a lot of the expenses haven't hit the books yet. Mm -hmm. um, I, I wonder if we have a perspective on um, how, you know, are, are, is, are we likely to come in at 103% of expenditure or do, do we know enough to tell? I can certainly ask him. And um, I'm just sort of wondering, obviously most of the expenses are still happening during this COVID-19, but there are some expenses that just aren't, are there any expenses that aren't happening because of the current circumstances? Um, potentially uh, there could be, but we're, we're unsure at this point. We're keeping track of additional expenses. And the, um, I think I mentioned earlier that the state has access to federal dollars that'll enable us to spend a little more flexibly than we otherwise might. Um, and then there are additional uh, dollars that are hopefully going to be added to the um, education fund and help offset uh, statewide expenses for next year. And there's some big. That makes big sense. Thanks. Sure. Yeah, there's some big implications for the economic impact of this whole thing uh, for next budgeting season. Um, you know, vary from tax rates all the way down to um, expenses at the school level. Yeah, that makes sense. Hard to hard to figure it right at the moment. Yeah, but I'll um, I'll ask John about his projection. In terms of of the expenses at the school level how are we 
I mean, I'm imagining that all of the teachers and their contract are all still getting paid. So how does that affect paras and janitors and food service workers and all of the other people that are not necessarily like teacher staff with that contract? Yeah, no, that's a great question. So um, early on, um, and I think Governor Scott's first directive, he mentioned that, or he directed that all school staff would continue to get paid. And we've since been directed by the state to draft um, a uh, procedure for that. So to um, basically document that we are paying and, and we're very, very much interested in paying staff. We have a lot of support staff. We're really anxious about, um, you know, logging their seven hours per day. We've been telling them, you know, this is this is flipped everything on its head. Don't expect that you'll be working seven solid hours a day. Um, and Heather and Amy and uh, Tess Martin worked really hard in coming up with a plan, you know, a menu of options, including uh, the meal delivery, the child care, but also um, services in directly in support of students, um, both individuals and groups of students. So um, after the break, and we had a, a, um, a, a smaller version of this menu to last us these two weeks, but now we've, um, created a bigger one and they'll be choosing things and documenting their time. We want to make sure that if the state audits us, that we have evidence that this is what these people have been doing. They've been earning their, their salaries. So we're definitely very much interested in continuing to pay our staff and they're, and they're continuing to work. A lot of, a lot of great volunteer work too. Um, people going above and beyond. And so have we been looking like, in terms of the fact that the buildings are basically shuttered and the, I'm assuming that means that we are not necessarily spending as much. I realize that people are the highest expense and I'm, I have absolutely no problem with that. And I would love for the money to mostly go toward them, but I'm assuming that there's some money that is not being spent in yeah. terms of the buildings and the electricity and the water. What I, I don't know all the details, but, that kind of thing. Yeah, fuel oil. And um, I think all of that will sort of play out at the end of the year, we'll have a better idea. But you're right. So the, the buildings aren't being utilized. We're saving money on supplies. Um, we're also going to get uh, maintenance staff are going to get a jump start on some of the summer projects. Usually they have this very for them a very tight window during the summer, during which to, you know, not only clean the buildings, but take care of a lot of other maintenance issues. Um, so with the buildings empty, some of them are getting a real jump start on that. Um, but but you're right, we should see some savings. You're also right, you know, personnel take up the the biggest chunk. In any case, everything we're spending pretty much was budgeted for. These um, salaries certainly were all budgeted for. Um, and like I said, anything that we're spending, there's a special COVID line, you know, number for the budget, and we're we're keeping track of stuff. Um, we also, all our schools lent out um, health supplies to local health agencies, um, and we've kept track of what went on, went out to ensure that we get it back. But, um, there's a lot of blending of boundaries that's going on right now um, so that we can help folks uh, get through this sort of in a collective way. Thank you. Field trips, there'd be some savings with field trips. Mm. Yeah, the virtual ones uh, cost a lot less money. <laughs> yeah. How about uh, vacation? Are, are vacations happening? Like, yeah. Are people taking yeah. paid time off? And yep, so uh, these, uh, so April break will occur. Um, definitely tell folks that um, people really deserve it, obviously, both staff and students. Um, and then we're treating. Other time off, we have these FLT days, so they're flexible leave time, and we're still using them according to the way the CBA uh, has designed them. So someone might um, put in for a sick day, uh, but it's the same procedure. You know, they fill out the same form or contact the same person. Um, and then vacation primarily, primarily applies to um, people like at central office who, who aren't part of that um, um, teaching calendar. So, you know, next week, everyone who teaches will get the time off. That, that's their vacation. 
um, but we have other people putting in for other vacations because they're not part of that that teaching timeline. And that's pretty much you know as it's always been. So nothing's really changed there. Adam, did you talk about the? I had to step out for a minute and came back while you were talking about the staffing. Did you mention the paraprofessionals and what's happening with um, their positions? Are they pretty secure? Yes. Yeah, so the upshot of that uh, conversation was, yeah, we're we're uh, paying everyone according to their contract. Um, everyone's position is secure and para, uh, paras and other support staff are documenting their time so that if we're audited by the state, we have evidence that um, they've been working and they've been um, serving students. So any other questions? Um, if, uh, we all got a, um, a email from John about how we're supposed to handle the warrants, correct? Yeah, there's a voucher folder in the um, in your. Uh, let's see, it's right, it's right next to your April 6, twenty twenty. It says vouchers. So, if everyone would take a look at that and then just send an email to Sonia, right? Is that how it's working, Adam? I believe so. Yeah. So, if you just send an email to Sonia Darling saying that you have looked at the warrants and that you approve them. Um, I don't, we don't have to, do we have to download the um, signature page and send that no. to her? Or is that just Casey? No. Yeah, you'll sign them later on. After all this is over, we'll have a big signature party or something. Okay. We'll get a lot of signing. But Casey, you're doing the signing, correct? I'm I'm reviewing and then uh, I'm just giving an, an approved via email. Okay. All right. Thank you. So if everyone would you know do that within the next few days of just going in looking at the vouchers, just saying that you've looked at them and approved them, that would be really helpful. Is it everybody sure. or is it just the officers? Well, actually, that's the good question, Adam. Does it just need to be? Me and um, Rosie. I thought so he said. A, I don't. Th I think as a board, you just approve the consent agenda, and then Casey should probably just forward and say, "Yeah, we approve the." Um, but what do you normally do? Do you normally actually? It's the, me uh, and Rosie Casey are the only three signatures that are required for the OSSU. Yes, so. I think it's so in those, the boards. Everyone's so that, to look at them. Right. So the three of you would contact Sony and say we approve. Yeah. Okay. All right. Rose, you can do that. Sorry. It, it looked from John's email like the clerk would review and send us an email that the, that the clerk had um, reviewed them all. That's what, that was my reading of John's email, but I might have misunderstood it. Ah, oh, okay. I, I'm, so it says... It says, let's see, uh, shoot. The clerk will do their normal review and via email will approve the batch. This will release the payment to the district treasurer who will approve via email. Um, once the clerk has reviewed and approved, we will need the other officers to approve as well via email. Okay, so you and I need to approve. After the clerk has approved first, it looks like. Right. Yeah, just the officers can approve them on a monthly basis of the same manager, emailing Heather Massey and CC Brittany Curie and John <coughs> Smith. Sounds good. Okay. Um, all right. So, do I have a motion to approve the consent agenda? I make a motion to approve the consent agenda. All right. Is there a second? I'll second that. All right. Everybody unmute. And all in favor of approving the agenda, indicate by saying aye. 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 Um, <laughs> all opposed? 
All abstentions. All right, this uh, agenda is, consent agenda is passed. Um, do we have any list of future items for the agenda that you'd like to mention now? The fundraising policy. Okay. That was on last month's, uh, should be in last month's folder. Can we get it in the May folder too? Yeah. Okay. I think um, next month, Catherine and I could do an update on uh, how things are going with brainstorming for the um, OSUD Elementary District, okay. right? Because we'll have a meeting with Lakeview, a virtual meeting um, between now and then, and we've had a teacher meeting, so we could report out on that. Perfect. Great. That would be super fun. <laughs> Anything else? Okie dokie. Um, so I'd like to put us into executive session so we can talk about negotiations, which means, um, Rose, you probably need to. Yeah. Away, yeah, I'll excuse myself from that one. I'm going to leave the meeting if that if that's good. Yep. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. I can go. Bye bye. 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 Hardwick, Hardwick Community Television.